Hey there, amazing ACCA students. My name is Steve Willis. In this video, I'm going to help you pass your upcoming performance management exam. Now guys, buckle up. In this video, we're going to go into practice exam one. We're going to do the full section A, all 15 OT questions together. Now guys, before you go further, go into the practice platform, find practice exam one, try the section A questions on your own, then continue watching the video. All right, guys, let's get started. I'm in practice exam one, section A, ready to get started. I'd like you to remember in the real exam, give yourself 50 minutes for section A. You want to do the easier questions first and then come back and do the more difficult ones later. Now this is number question number one and it's not the most difficult question I've ever seen but it looks a little tricky. There are a lot of numbers there. So I made the tactical decision to flag this one and then I would go through all of the questions first trying to do the easiest ones. There's probably some theory ones that are a little bit easier. But for our video, I will go through them sequentially from this point on. First thing to do, read the question stem. We are looking for a budgeted life cycle cost per unit. So I rely on my technical knowledge. I remember life cycle costing all costs related to the product from the past and the future. That is not the same as relevant costing when we're making a future short-term decision. So guys, let's do this in the scratch pad. I'm going to show you the exam technique for those of you working home invigilation exams because you cannot use scratch paper. If you're, if you're working in the exam center, you can do it on scratch paper. Now, I'm going to make a little template here and I know looking, scanning the, the figures here, I see that I've got some fixed costs. I see that we've got a variable cost and I see mention of overheads. Okay, so I'm going to categorize my costs and then get it to the unit level. And I look at the answers and they want, it, they want a unit level answer. So let's work in units from the beginning. And I see that the design costs are 800,000. I see the depreciation for the life is 500,000. And I see that we've got decommissioning costs of 20. And those are all of my costs over the life. And that's to produce 300,000. So that's going to get me a fixed cost per unit. If I do that math, variable cost is 20. And overheads, let's check out the overheads and we can make an overhead absorption rate. We've got 72 million in overhead cost. We do, that's annual, divided by 96 annu, annual hours. That's millions, but we can round it down like that. And that's the overhead absorption rate per hour. And we see that it's four hours per unit. Okay, so that's my, my template, my setup. That's where I'm going. Now I can do the math and our fixed cost per unit is 4.4. Variable cost is 20. And the overheads come to three. So I can start eliminating. I know that the answer has to be 40 cents, not 73 cents. So I can cross out the second and the fourth and the correct answer jumping out at me, the third option. Guys, there you have it. Life cycle costing question one. Moving on to question number two. And we have a fill in the blank. Can't guess at this one, can you? So this is the second question, possibly in the real exam. Flag it, move on. Let's see if there's something easier. But we're here. We're going to do it now. Again, we'll do it in the scratch pad. The first step, always read the question stem. What are they asking us? Total number of units, which much must be made and sold to make a profit of 45. 
right away I see this is cost volume profit and I will rely on my technical knowledge again I remember that the units to reach a technical the units to reach a target profit would be the fixed cost plus the target profit divided by the contribution per unit. I'm abbreviating just to demonstrate that's exactly what you guys are going to do in the real exam. The marking team does not look at your scratch pad. Now that we have a template, we can read the story and look for the details. And we see that it's a multiple product problem. So I'm going to work in terms of packages. That's the trick here. Instead of working in units, first we'll work in packages and then move it to the unit level. So a company makes and sells X's and Y's. Twice as many Y's are made and sold as that of X. We're going to have two Y's, Y, Y, X. That's three units. Again, I'm using the scratch pad just to stay organized and do my workings. Now we got to get the contribution for a package. And do they tell us that? Each X makes a contribution of 10, each Y makes a four. So I'm gonna use a little mental math here, and that's gonna be 10 plus four plus four, that's 18. Now we've got our fixed costs of 90, the target profit is 45. So we can use that template. And I, because it's fill in the blank, I'm going to do my work. I'm not going to do rounding off. I don't want to get, I don't want to risk a rounding error here in, in the fill in the blank. So let's just do it to the one. So my fixed costs, 90,000. Target profit, 45,000. And if I divide that by 18, that's going to give me the number of packages. And let's do the math. That's equal to 7,500 packages. If we were to put that figure into that fill in the blank, unfortunately, it would be wrong because that's packages. We got to multiply it by three to get to units. There are three units in a virtual package. And that comes to 22,500. There you have it, question number two. Moving on to question three, first thing we do, read the question stem and we see what was the favorable material yield variance. Tricky topic variance analysis and it's fill in the blank so we can't even guess. Guys, this is a potentially difficult question. Now, I go through many variance analysis questions in great detail on my website, accaexamhelp.com. The link is right here. If you want more help with variance analysis, you can head over there and get a whole bunch of videos on variance analysis, including this question. I do this question in more detail, but for our purposes now, I'm going to do it quick and fast. I'm going to show you the exam technique. So let's get started here. We understand we're looking for a yield variance. I remember that the yield variance is quite similar to the usage variance from MA. It answers the same question. When we produce 3,000 units, that's the actual production, jumping off the page at me there. How much material should we use? How much material did we use? Let's answer this question. So I open up the scratch pad and I see 3,000 units. So first thing we should understand, one unit should use how much material? And I see the J is five, the K is two, the L is three, so that's 10 kg. 3,000 should use 30,000 then. 
and how much material was actually used. Let's go to the actual units there and we can add those up. I'll pop those figures into my calculator. The 13200, the 6500, and the 9300, the J, the K, and the L. And we see that 3000 did use 29,000 kg. So we know the variance is favorable. If this were a multiple choice, at this point we could eliminate probably two of the and solutions And what is there. the savings of raw material? Well, that's 1,000 kilos of raw material saved. And what is the average cost per kilo? Well, one unit should cost $68. They give us those figures on a silver platter right in the table. That's dollars. And we said it's 10 kilos, isn't it? So if we divide that by 10, that's going to get me 6.8 per kilo in average terms. And we save 1,000 units. 1,000 kilos in, excuse me. We save 1,000 kilos. So the variance is then 68,000. Favorable. Guys, there you have it. The solution, 68,000 favorable. Plug that into your fill in the blank and press next. Moving on to question four. Finally, an easier one, a theoretical one. This is the kind of question that I want to clear first. Even if I wasn't sure about it, I could do this faster than I could the previous calculation questions. So remember, in the real exam, do the easy ones first. And we see a manufacturer and retailer of kitchens introduces an ERP SAP system. SAP and Oracle are common examples of ERPs you might see in big companies. These are unified database systems that help companies collect, store, and then use their information. Now, which of the following is not likely to be a potential benefit? It's actually kind of a little tricky, this question, isn't it? Well, I see the first three options, scheduling labor, recording inventory, recording sales. These are standardized processes that the ERP will help us with rather easily. Now, summarizing critical strategic information, that's the fourth one. That's the most difficult one. Now we might need to go to the external environment. We need to go look at our competitors' websites, what are their competitive advantages, how are our products different, what markets are they in, etc. So the ERP will be um, least likely to help us with the fourth option. So option four is the right answer here. Moving on to question five, a, a, a test of your raw technical knowledge about environmental management accounting. And I'm looking at the techniques. One of these techniques involves analyzing costs under three distinct headings, material, systems, delivery, and disposal. I'm going to use the multiple choice options now to help recall what are the different tools in the EMA toolbox so I can eliminate. Now, the first thing I can eliminate input output analysis because I remember that's about units. Here we're measure measuring physical units rather than monetary values. So I eliminate the third one. Life cycle costing. Well, life cycle costing is about understanding the full cost of our products over their entire life cycle. What are the future costs based on our decisions today? Things like shutdown costs, environmental cleanup costs. Well, there's nothing in the question about timing of costs. So life cycle costing can go out. Activity-based costing is about overhead analysis. 
looking into our indirect costs, nothing there. Flow cost accounting by elimination is the one that fits best. So the answer, guys, is the fourth option. Moving on to number six, a theoretical question that has a little scenario attached to it. So we look at the question stem, which of the three E's in the value for money framework is being measured here. And we cross off the fourth one immediately. That's not in the model expertise. If we had to guess, we've improved our chances a bit. Now let's read the story. A government is trying to assess schools by using a range of financial and non-financial factors. One of the chosen methods is the percentage of students passing five exams or more. Nothing about the cost of the inputs. There's nothing here about the average teacher salary versus the, the nation. So it's not economy. It's not efficiency. Efficiency is about maximizing our outputs per units of input. And the efficiency ones would be compound metrics, something per something, students per teacher. It's not efficiency. Effectiveness is about reaching the mission, our objectives. And schools are trying to educate students. So student pass rates is most linked to the objective of the school. So effectiveness here is the best option. Option three. Moving on to question seven, we see a short question, a theoretical question, but it's kind of tricky. This is testing rather deep knowledge of target costing. If you studied under time pressure, you might have not, you might not have gone into the level of detail that this question is testing, but not a problem. If you're well prepared and you don't know a couple of these objective test questions, you can still take a guess, you can still get a pass. But let's do the question together. Target costing, as you remember, is a modern approach to cost reduction. First, we set a selling price. Our marketing department does that. Then we determine the profit that is required from that selling price. The difference between those two figures is the target cost. We compare that target cost to the expected cost, and we come up with a cost gap. That's our cost reduction target. Close that gap. Now, look at all of this analysis. If I had to guess, I would just guess on variance analysis because that goes with cost control, not cost reduction. That's the traditional tool of budgeting and control. But let's look at the other options. Well, we have value analysis. We have functional analysis. These happen in the design stage. And they're quite similar here. These are techniques for cost reduction, value analysis. We want to make sure we don't cut out raw materials that harm the value of our product. For example, imagine we're making luxury automobiles. Our market research says we need to provide leather seats. So we don't want to change out the leather to vinyl to reduce costs. That's value analysis. Functional analysis. Now, maybe we're looking at the features of our product that our customers find important. So when we reduce costs, we don't want to cut out important features. Maybe cruise control or automatic windows for general examples there. We wouldn't cut those features of the luxury automobile when we're trying to reduce the costs. And then activity analysis. Here we're looking at our processes, our business activities. How can we be more efficient to reduce the cost per unit? So that's why those three options would be considered correct. Guys, there you have it, a tricky question. The answer is the second one. Moving on to question eight, another theoretical question. Here we're looking at information systems and we have a little scenario. We read the question stem first. Which of the following would not be a control, an effective control procedure for the generation and distribution of information within a government department? Well, let's read the little story before we try and get the answer. 
A government department generates information which should not be disclosed to anyone who works out of the department. There are many other government departments working within the same building. So this is about the security of the information and we even need security within the building. And if we look at the first option, that is obviously an ineffective control using a memory stick to take data home. Well, of course, you can leave a memory stick on the public transportation or you can bring a virus in. So we don't like the first option. That's not going to help with data security. The next three are all reasonable. Using passwords, physical access control, the third one, using identity cards, and the fourth one, locking up hard copies of information. So the first one is the correct answer. Moving on to question nine, we see a new question type. Here we have to check on the relevant boxes and we read the question stem and we need to determine if the two listed resources are Slack resources or binding resources. That's the opposite of a Slack resource. That keyword triggers the technical knowledge of linear programming. So we are talking about a multiple limiting factor type of problem. A binding resource is one that is fully consumed by our production plan. We have nothing left over that's limiting our output. The Slack resource, well, we have extra. We could do more things with the leftover labor or machine time. So we need to determine if all of the hours are consumed by the production plan. So let us read the story. We see our company makes two products, R's and N's. We are given constraints and we have the less than or equal to sign in both rows confirming that we have constraints. We have a maximum of 2,400 labor hours, 410 machine hours. And all we have to do is apply that production plan, the 500 R's and 400 N's to each equation and see if the production uses up all of the hours. So we can do that in the scratch pad. The first equation, that's going to be equal to 3 multiplied by 500, that's 3 hours times 500 units plus 2 hours times 400 units. The second one for machine hours, well that's going to be 0 0.5 multiplied by 500 plus 0 0.4 multiplied by 400. We do the math and we get 410. Comparing our results to the table, the production plan takes 2,300 labor hours. We have some left over. That means it's slack. However, machine time is fully consumed, so there is no slack. Guys, that is the solution to question nine. Moving on to question 10. Here we're looking at divisional performance measurement. We're looking at return on investment. This looks like a tricky one, but let's go for it. Assuming no other changes to profit or net assets, what is the return on investment for the year? Let's use the scratch pad to make a template. Return on investment will be equal to some profit before interest and tax, okay, over some investment. Could it be net assets? Could it be capital employed? Let's see what information the question gives us. At the end of 2001, an investment center has net assets of 1 million, so that would be the denominator, and annual operating profits of 190,000. That would be the numerator. So without any other 
complications, the return on investment would be equal to the 190 over 1000, dropping the zeros. Let's now read the next line and deal with the complications and take them one at a time. Well, a machine with a net book value of 40, 40,000 was sold at the start of the year for $50,000. That's going to impact the profit. We made a profit of 10. That's also going to impact our asset base by 10. We credited asset 40, but then we debit 50 with the cash. So that's plus 10. Now we bought a machine for 2,500. And because everything is a cash transaction, that will have no impact on my investment base because it will be plus 250,000 to the asset minus 250,000 cash. So we plug the numbers into our calculator and we get 0 0.198 a little bit more as well. We look at the answers and then we see 19.8 is the answer to question 10. Moving on to question 11. The first thing I do is read the question, stem the requirement, and I see which of the following options will improve throughput. I know the word throughput is linked to throughput accounting. And that's the only place we need to use the word throughput. So what's going to improve throughput? Improving the time on the bottleneck resource. So we've got to find the bottleneck. That's the only way we can improve throughput. Let's look at the story. A manufacturing company uses three processes to make their two products, X and Y. And the time is reduced on the processes because of maintenance and breaks. Now let's have a look. We've got hours available per day and the time per unit. Do we have a demand? Yes, we do. Let's open up the scratch pad. Let's make one line for each of our processes. One, two, three. Remember, no one's gonna check our scratch pad work. So write quickly, write efficiently. So process one will be one times 10 plus 0 0.75 times 16. Process two, well, that will be 0 0.75 times 10 plus one times 16. Process three. That will be 1 times 10 plus 0 0.5 times 16. I've got my equations laid out. Now I can do the math. And we can essentially do this in mental math. Don't even need calculators. So that's 10 plus 12. The first one is 22. The second one I see is 23.5 and the fourth one, 18. Have we found the bottleneck? Yes, we have. Look at that. Process one takes 22 hours. We have 22 hours. Process three takes 18 hours. We have 18 hours. But process two, we need 23.5 hours. We only have 22 hours. So it's process two that will limit our production. Process two is the bottleneck. Answer, everybody, is the first one. Increasing demand for both products. That's the obvious distractor to eliminate if you had to take a guess. That will not improve throughput. Moving on to question 12. Tricky question here, materials, operational, price, variance. I'm going to take you through the quick exam technique here. If you'd like a full explanation of this question, check out my website 
accaexamhelp.com. I've got a whole bunch of videos there on variance analysis if you'd like a deeper dive into this specific question. But let's go for it. I'm going to open up the scratch pad. I read the question stem. What is the materials operational price variance? Operational versus planning variances. That has a specific pro forma. I will deploy the template. Actual quantity, actual price. Let me give some spaces there. Actual quantity, standard price. Some more spaces. Act, standard quantity, standard price. Alphabetical order. I now remember on the left side will be the price variance. On the right side will be the usage variance. These are the basic variances from my MA exam. And we move from right to left, asking the question, asking and answering the questions should cost, did cost. We're moving now from the flexed budget to the actual results. SS answers the question, how much should actual production cost? AA, that's the actual spend. How much did actual production cost? Now, if we're going to break a variance down into components, all we have to do is put another number in between the two variables. So I'd put a number here for the price. I'd put a number here for the usage. And this is where my alphabetical order system comes in again. I remember that price is here on the left. So underneath the price variance, I'm going to revise the price. Usage, underneath usage, I would revise the quantity. So watch what I do. I'm going to have actual quantity, actual price. That's the original var variable on the left. Actual quantity standard price that's the original variant variable in the middle now and on the in the middle now I'm going to insert a new figure here that's going to be actual quantity revised standard price and I remember to revise standard price because it's right under price we still work from right to left Again, I'm doing this intentionally in the scratch pad. I'm showing you how we might do this if we're doing home invigilation exams and we can't use scratch paper. If you had scratch paper in the exam hall, you could do, be a bit more efficient here. Okay, underneath those is the price variance. And I use alphabetical order here. On the left side is operational on the right side is planning now that I have recalled my template I know this is a lot guys I can take you through this whole system on my website www.accaexamhelp.com if, if you want to go through it in greater detail now that I have my templates laid out. I know I am going for the operational price variance. I isolate which variance I want. Now I know that I need these figures from the question. I need the actual quantity, the actual price, I need the actual quantity, and the revised standard price. When I find those, I can answer the question. So I read the story and we see this company uses recycled plastic to make shopping baskets. And the rest of this paragraph gives me the standard cost card with information for the standard cost card. We don't need budgeted production here unless we're doing a sales volume variance. We don't need that. Now we see that due to new incentives, the standard price of recycled plastic was expected to reduce to 0 0.4. Guys, that is the revised standard price. 
actual price was 0 0.42. 100,000 baskets were made using 20,000 kilos of recycled plastic. So that is my actual quantity. So underneath that now, let me set this up. Actual quantity is 20,000 multiplied by actual price, 0 0.42. I'm going to move from the right to the left. Actual quantity, 20,000 multiplied by 0 0.42. Four. And I see that the price is higher. The actual price is higher than the revised standard. So let's look at the options. I've got two adverse, don't I? Now, I could do the math as is, or I could just take an algebraic shortcut. I see that the difference here is simply going to be 0 0.02, right? That's the two cent increase in the price, or the four, 0 0.42 minus 0 0.40 multiplied by 20,000. And the answer then is going to be the multiple of four, 400 adverse, right there. Price is higher, so we know it's adverse. Friends, there you have it, a tricky question. Again, check out my website. The link is right here if you'd like to do more variance analysis together. Moving on to question 13. Boy, another difficult looking question. After adjusting for the external factors outside of the manager's control, in which category is there evidence of poor performance? This is an example of one I would flag it. It's guessable. I'd flag it. I'd finish up the exam questions. I'd finish up 14 and 15. I'd go look for easier things to do, and I would do this one at the end. And if I had to, I'd throw down a guess. But let's do it together. So we have a profit center manager who's claiming that the poor performance of her division is due to factors out of her control. Here we have a table. And we have budget. We have actual this year. We have actual last year and market expert notes. Guys, here is the spoiler. What we need to do is flex the budget according to the market expert notes and see if the budget this year <clears throat> beats or doesn't beat the flexed budget. Let's open up the scratch pad and get busy. Let me set up a little table. I've got sales volume. SV is a nice abbreviation for that. SR, sales revenue. Total material cost. Well, let's see what's happening here. Well, the budget this year is 500. The actual this year is 300. So the manager didn't hit their budget. Let's see what happened. The entire market has decreased by 25% compared to last year. The product will be obsolete in four years. So if we look at the first one, sales volume, <clears throat> last year we had a budget of 400. This year we have a budget of 500, but the market actually decreased. 
So that budget was too rosy. We should revise the budget and we can then take last year's budget, 400 multiplied by 0 0.75 and that's going to be equal to 300. So the sales manager is actually on target. The actual is in line with that revised budget. Let's look at sales revenue. Rivalry in the market saw selling prices fall by 10%. Let's look at last year's selling price. 40,000 revenue divided by 40, 400 units. Let's look at the budgeted price per unit from last year. And Let's use the scratch pad to get organized and do our work. We can make one row for each item. We've got sales volume. We've got total revenue and we've got total material cost. Now let's look at the performance under sales volume. Well, last year we sold 400. The budget this year was 500. But if we look at the marketing notes, the entire market actually decreased. So that budget is very inaccurate. The market dropped, it didn't grow. So that as a target is unfair. If we revise the budgeted sales volume, it would be 400 multiplied by 0 0.75, which equals 300. So the profit center manager actually hit the target if we look at the external factors. Total revenue. Well, let's look at last year's selling price. Well, last year we did 40,000 in sales divided by 400 units. That's going to be $100 per unit as a selling price. But rivalry in the market saw that prices dropped. So if we multiply that price by 0 0.9, taking 10% 10, 10 off, we will get $90 as a revised selling price for our budget. And we didn't sell 500 units, we sold 300 units, so we need to flex the budget. And 90 times 300 is equal to 27,000. So the actual is actually exceeding that flexed budget. So the manager did a good job under sales revenue if we consider the external factors. At this point, we could use elimination and we would, we would choose the first option, material cost only. But let's do the math and, and, and prove that that one is correct. Well, we could find the cost per unit would be $20. We can see 8,000 divided by 400 is $20. And the demand for raw materials is decreasing, so suppliers lowered their prices by 5% multiplied by 0 0.95. And that comes to $19 per unit of material. How many did we actually sell? We could say produce as well. And 300. So the material cost, the flexed material cost, would then be 300 times 19. And that comes to 5,000 
$700. The actual this year is 6,500. So the manager overspent in the materials when we compare the actual to the flexed budget. So the answer is the option, the first option. Guys, a tricky question. If you made the tactical decision in the exam to skip this one, do other easier things and come back and give this a guess, I would respect that decision. Moving on to 14. This is an example of why you need to get through all of the questions in the first 50 minutes. You wouldn't want to run out of time and not get to this question because it's an easy question, maybe the easiest of all of them in the set. Well, click indicate by clicking on the boxes which of the following statements regarding market penetration as a pricing strategy are correct. For penetration pricing, think of Netflix. Netflix uses penetration pricing. They give you a discount at the beginning to entice you to buy their services, to help improve their market share, to spread their fixed costs over more subscribers. So we like penetration pricing when economies of scale can be achieved, when we have high fixed costs. That one is correct. It is useful if demand is highly elastic. We like that one also. If we lower the price, demand increases. So that one is correct. Guys, when this is examined, it's often examined in contrast to market skimming as a strategy. That's the strategy of iPhone. High prices at the beginning, demand is inelastic. Put the prices up, people still line up to buy the iPhone and it has a relatively short life cycle. Anyway, I digress. There you have the answer to 14. Moving on to our last question in the set. I read the question stem. I see an activity-based costing type of question. This is a tricky, time-consuming question, but let's go for it. Let's use the scratch pad to get organized. Now, when I'm doing activity-based costing, I remember first I've got to find cost pools, cost drivers, cost per driver, then I can do an ABC costing by product. And we read the stem. What is the total fixed overhead to be absorbed into each unit of B? So let's have a look at the question. A company makes two products using the same type of materials and skilled workers. There's no variation in the inputs there. And we see volume, material price per unit, <clears throat> and we see volume, <clears throat> and we see a nice clearly laid out table. We've got products as column headings and we've got volume, material cost per unit, labor cost per unit. And then we have our overhead pools. So the first step, cost pools. And we have material handling. And we have general fixed overheads. And the material handling costs 100,000. The general overheads 180,000 cost pools. What are the drivers for the material handling? Well, it's the volume of material purchased. And we only have one grade of materials, so we can work in dollars. We don't have to work in units. And I'm looking at the, to the total material would be One thousand times ten dollars plus two thousand times twenty dollars. So that's the total material 
that we're going to use. And now if we look at the general fixed overheads, that's based on labor. And that's going to be 1,000 times 5 plus 2,000 times 20. That will be the total amount of labor that I spend. If we do the math, we can now get <clears throat> if we do the math we can see 50,000 as the total spend on materials and 45,000 as the total spend on labor there now just to simplify I'm gonna get rid of this working remember we're in the scratch pad. There are no marks for showing your workings here. Uh, the, the <clears throat> At this point, I'm going to declutter my working. I'm just going to get rid of that. <clears throat> <clears throat> At this point, guys, let me declutter my working. I'm going to get rid of the the formula that I built up. I don't need that anymore now that I got the result. Remember, I'm showing you exam technique for your computer-based exams. There will be no marks for showing workings. The marking team will not look into your scratch pad. Okay, so we know the total spend on materials. We know the total spend on labor. And we're looking at product B. So let's look at the total material spend on product B. That's going to be 40,000. So we multiply the 100,000 by 40,000 over 50,000. That's the percentage of our overheads that go to product B. And we do the same thing down here. That'll be the 180,000 general overheads multiplied by 40, 2,000 times 20. I do the math, and the first one I can do with mental math. That's 1,000 times 80 percent, 100,000 times 80 percent, 80,000. The second one, I'll use my calculator. That comes to 160,000. So my total for product B then, so my total for product B will be equal to the sum of the 80 and the 160 or 240,000. And if I divide that by 2,000 units, I get $120. Plug that answer into my fill in the blank. There we have it, the correct answer activity-based costing. Friends, there you have it. Section A of practice exam number one. I hope you found something useful there. If you'd like to see more videos like this, I've got a whole bunch of videos on performance management, section A questions on my website, accaexamhelp.com. So head over there if you want to get more videos like this. You can also find content here on my YouTube channel. Everyone, good luck on your upcoming exams. This is Steve signing out for now.